Hey, it's Conan, and I'm going to be talking about sepsis today in my Google Image PowerPoint. So here are some pimp questions that you might be getting. So what are the four categories of sepsis in sepsis 1, which was developed in 1992, and sepsis 2, which was 2001? And how did these definitions change when sepsis 3 came out in 2016? What is early goal-directed therapy, and should we still be using it? And what is the surviving sepsis campaign, and what does it tell us to do? So these are the main goals of this talk. So uh, here, I just wanted to go into the history of sepsis because it actually has a pretty long history uh, that's changed through the years and I feel like it really gives a good framework for how we define sepsis nowadays. So I think the most important ones are um, in 1992, which is when sepsis was first defined in this article and established sepsis 1, which is this, what this was called. Uh, and then in 2001, we got sepsis 2, and then finally, in 2016, we got sepsis 3, which is what we are now supposed to be using. So let's talk about sepsis 1 and sepsis 2. So sepsis 1 is the first definition of sepsis that first introduced the concept of the SIRS criteria, which is temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and white blood count. And then there were four steps in the sepsis pathway. So you could be SIRS positive, and then if you had two SIRS, plus a confirmed or suspected infection, then you can call it sepsis. Uh, once you start having hypotension, lactate, signs of end organ damage, that's severe sepsis. And then finally, if you have persistent hypotension with fluids, then it becomes septic shock. And then finally, on the very end of the spectrum, you have this multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, which is failure of two or more organs. So in 2001, we had sepsis 2, which added a whole bunch of other criteria. But you can see it got really complicated. So, um, you know, we have a bunch of new criteria to diagnose sepsis. Uh, but I think really a lot of this stuff didn't actually get used that much because it just was a little bit too cumbersome. Uh, but it was just kind of in the back of people's minds. So what were the problems with sepsis uh, 1 and 2? Well, the first one is that SIRS is very nonspecific. So if you're exercising, your heart rate goes up and your respiratory rate goes up and you're septic. Or for example, I was just on my hemonc rotation and a lot of people have leukemia. So they have very low cell counts or very high cell counts. And if they just have a mild elevation in their heart rate, then they're considered septic as well. Uh, and then the other problem is that, as I mentioned before, sepsis 2 is very cumbersome and complicated. So uh, that's why in 2016, they introduced the concept of sepsis 3. So instead of using the SIRS criteria, they wanted to use this new criteria called the SOFA score, which again was very complicated. But then they introduced this uh, bedside score that you could use, which is called the quick SOFA. And the quick SOFA is just uh, three different components. It's a systolic blood pressure less than 100, respiratory rate greater than 22, and altered mental status defined by a GCS of less than 15. And again, with the QSOFA criteria, if you have two or more points, then you have high risk of a poor outcome. So this was supposed to be the replacement for the SIRS criteria. So now if we take a look at the sepsis steps, what they also did in sepsis 3 is they removed the SIRS criteria. They also removed this definition of severe sepsis. And sepsis now is defined by a QSOFA score of greater than or equal to 2 plus confirmed or suspected infection. So really, we should not be using SIRS as a terminology anymore or severe sepsis. But you'll notice that People still use this because it's been so ingrained in them for such a long time. Uh, and, you know, there has been some controversy uh, with some people in terms of accepting the new uh, sepsis 3 definitions. Uh, so people will still be using sep severe sepsis and SIRS, even though we're technically not really supposed to anymore. Okay, and then I also wanted to go briefly into this concept of early goal-directed therapy, which was developed in 2001. So in early goal-directed therapy, basically, uh, there was this study in 2001 that compared standard therapy versus early goal-directed therapy. And the only real difference between them all was that in early goal-directed therapy, they were measuring the mean venous oxygen uh, concentration. So everybody had a central line and they were measuring from there. Uh, but both of them, both standard and early goal-directed therapy, would rely on central venous pressure, MAP greater than 65, and urine output over 0 0.5. 
Uh, and then they came up with this whole algorithm for you. So if their CVP was low, you give them more fluids. MAP was low, you give them some pressors. If their mean venous oxygen was low, you give them some transfusions. You give some inotropic agents. Uh, and then you continue reassessing conti consistently to make sure you're hitting these targets. So now, recently, there's been more studies that have showed that early goal-directed therapy is no longer superior to standard care, probably because standard care has gotten so much better. So really, the, the big takeaway from this is that we don't really need to be using this uh, venous concentration anymore. As long as we're hitting all of these goals, that's still effective uh, as our standard therapy regimen. Finally, I wanted to talk about one more thing, which is the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. This is a campaign that started, I believe, in 2001, and the most recent update was in 2018. And the goal of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign is to reduce mortality from sepsis by 25%. So uh, what they initially uh, had introduced several years ago was the concept of a three-hour bundle and a six-hour bundle, which is a bunch of steps that need to be completed within this time frame. Okay, so it's things like measuring lactate, getting blood culture, is giving antibiotics and giving 30 cc's per kilogram of uh, crystalloid, which is another important uh, thing to know when somebody's septic, that's kind of the first line amount of fluids that you give somebody, 30 cc's per kilogram. Okay, in 2018, they changed this to the one hour bundle uh, just to simplify things. And I think this makes it a, a lot nicer. Uh, but in the first hour, you should measure their lactate, get blood cultures, give broad spectrum antibiotics, give crystalloid for hypotension, and give vasopressors. And this should all happen within the first hour in order to reduce mortality from sepsis. All right, signs of adequate resuscitation include these two markers and a normalized mental status and improving lactate. There's a couple of PIMP questions that I wanted to add on here. So one PIMP question that you may get is, what are the four most important things for treating sepsis? And the answer would be fluids, antibiotics, source control, and vasopressors. The preferred initial vasopressor is always norepinephrine. The most common organisms include E. coli, Staph aureus, Klebsiella, and Strep pneumo. And then Vank plus Zosin is often avoided due to an increased risk of AKI, but this is really institution dependent. It depends on which hospital you're working at and what their kind of culture is regarding the antibiotics. And then I just wanted to have this brief little discussion about uh, follow-up blood cultures for gram-negative bacteremia. So one thing that we know is that gram-negative uh, bacteremia, uh, once you start treating with antibiotics, they actually clear from the blood cultures pretty quickly. Um, whereas gram-positive uh, bacteremia can be very sticky. And so gram-positive bacteremia, you always want to continue getting blood cultures until you can document that they're negative. With gram-negatives, you can potentially just start them on antibiotics and do not get a follow-up negative blood culture. However, in practice, I think people still do tend to get the negative blood culture. Uh, but this is something that you might be asked on, uh, is whether or not you need to get a follow-up blood culture on gram-negative or gram-positives. And it's uh, you definitely do for gram-positives, not necessarily for gram-negatives. All right, what are your initial antibiotic choices uh, for empiric therapy of sepsis? So everybody should be getting empiric vancomycin. If they have a suspected gram-negative, which is basically everybody too, then you give a single agent. And if you have a suspected pseudomonal infection, then you give vanc plus two antisodomonals. Uh, here's a thing on up to date, and this just shows your standard sepsis uh, coming in. You give them vancomycin and cefepime. That's a very common combo, especially at my institution. Uh, but another very common combo is, again, the vancomycin and zosin. And then if you suspect pseudomonas, then you would do vanc, cefepime, and then an additional antipsudomonal. Um, but this is a little bit less common. I, I don't see this as, as frequently. All right, so key points just to close out this presentation. Sepsis has evolved significantly over the years. The terms SERS and severe sepsis should no longer be used. We should be using Q-SOFA instead. Early goal-directed therapy is no longer superior to standard therapy. No more need to measure the mean uh, O2 saturation. And then the surviving sepsis campaign has introduced the concept of the one-hour bundle. So I hope this clarified a little bit of the history of sepsis, uh, a, a little bit onto some of the definitions of sepsis and how they've changed over the years and how we're supposed to be using QSOFA now uh, because I thought that was always something that was a little confusing for me as I was going through medical school and hope you learned a little bit. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. <laughs>